Uh, Mr. President, I uh, rise today the for... The Senate is in a quorum call. May I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated? Without objection. I rise today for uh, time to wake up speech number 268 with my increasingly battered chart here to urge colleagues here in the Senate to wake up and see the looming danger that we face from climate change. Just look at the recent climate effects in our southern hemisphere. The most devastating wildfires anyone can remember have ripped across Australia, burned more than a fifth of Australia's forests, destroying thousands of homes, killing an estimated one billion animals, and making a day of breathing air in Sydney like smoking 37 cigarettes. In the ocean off Australia, new warnings that the Great Barrier Reef, a wonder of the world, visible from space, is doomed. The warmest temperatures ever were recorded in Antarctica, a 70-degree day when the average February temperature would be 33 degrees. Here's the Thwaites Glacier. Here on Antarctica's Thwaites Glacier, scientists drilled through 2,000 feet of ice down to the ocean water below and discovered water two degrees above freezing. 70 degrees above, two degrees above, it's a melting sandwich. Losing that glacier would trigger almost three feet of sea level rise, and that glacier is going. Sea level rise brings me to the crash warnings that are the subject of this speech, crash warnings that are flashing throughout the economy. Sea level rise connects to these crash warnings because some of these crash warnings revolve around sea level rise crashing coastal property values. Other warnings are of a crash in what economists call the carbon bubble. I have a binder of these warnings that I put together, and I sent this binder to every member of the Senate in February of 2019. Every member has all of the warnings that are compiled in that binder. I've got a letter, too, following up on the warnings in that binder, just about the warnings that emerged since February of 2019, and in fact, mostly uh, just this year. I sent this member to all of the members of the Senate Banking Committee because the economic crashes that are warned of are within the jurisdiction of the Senate Banking Committee, and that committee has its responsibility to be the distant early warning system for the rest of us in the Senate about these warnings. So I'd like to, uh, Mr. President, enter that letter to the Banking Committee members into the record. Without objection. The warnings, Mr. President, are serious. They come from some of our foremost financial experts. So let's walk through what we have in store if we keep sleepwalking through the climate crisis. Warning one, as I said, coastal property value crash. Freddie Mac not an environmental organization, the giant mortgage company, warned that rising sea levels will prompt a crash in coastal property values worse than the housing crash that triggered the 2008 financial crisis. First Street Foundation found that rising seas have already caused $16 billion in lost property values in coastal homes from Maine to Texas. Moody's, the bond rating agency, has warned that climate risk will trigger downgrades in coastal communities' bond ratings. BlackRock, the biggest asset manager in the world, estimated that by the end of the century, climate change will cause coastal communities annual losses averaging up to 15 percent of local GDP averaging up to 15 percent of local GDP, with hardest-hit communities obviously hit far worse. Hello, Florida. Warning two is the carbon asset bubble crash. The Bank of England, the Bank of France, the Bank of Canada, the European Central Bank, all backed by top-tier peer-reviewed economic papers, have warned that fossil fuel assets are dramatically overvalued on fossil fuel companies' books, 
that these assets are actually uneconomic and will become stranded, and that the resulting carbon asset bubble crash will swamp the world economy. How bad is it? Well, it's called, quote, systemic financial risk. Systemic financial risk is finance speak for risk to the entire economic system. Remember the 2008 financial crisis. Bad home mortgages blew up more than mortgage companies. They caused a brutal economic recession. Millions of people lost their jobs, their homes, and their retirement savings. We are still recovering from that collapse. That's systemic financial crisis. And the warnings are, this one will be worse. In my recent letter, I looked at the more recent warnings. Here's the Bank of International Settlements recent Green Swan report. The title is a reference to the metaphor of a black swan, an unpredictable event with calamitous consequences for the economy. Here is what my letter to the Banking Committee quoted from this Green Swan report. Page one warns that, and I quote, climate change could be the cause of the next systemic financial crisis. Page 65, quoting, central banks, regulators, and supervisors have increasingly recognized that climate change is a source of major systemic financial risks. And quoting again, climate catastrophes are even more serious than most systemic financial crises. Again, from page one, exceeding climate tipping points could lead to catastrophic and irreversible impacts that would make quantifying financial damages impossible. Let's slow down and do that one again. Exceeding climate tip tipping points could lead to catastrophic and irreversible impacts that would make quantifying financial damages impossible. As a little aside here, it's an odd coincidence that the report's language, catastrophic and irreversible, mirrors President Trump's warning in a New York Times ad in 2009 that climate change consequences would be catastrophic and irreversible. Same words, catastrophic and irreversible. Trump in 2009, Bank for International Settlements Green Swan Report just two months ago. Back to the Green Swan Report, page three. The complex chain reactions and cascade effects associated with both physical and transition risks could generate fundamentally unpredictable environmental, geopolitical, social, and economic dynamics fundamentally unpredictable economic dynamics, fundamentally unpredictable social dynamics. Page one again, climate-related risks will remain largely unhedgeable as long as system-wide action is not undertaken. Page three again, like the black swans from which the report drives its title, quoting here, the physical and transition risks are characterized by deep uncertainty and non-linearity. Their chances of occurrence are not reflected in past data, and the possibility of extreme values cannot be ruled out. The possibility of extreme values. Another big warning that I quoted from in my letter to the Banking Committee came from BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. In his open letter to CEOs, Fink echoes the green swan warning, saying, and I'm quoting here, climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects, end quote. And as a result, he continues, quoting again here, we are on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance, one that is, quote, compelling investors 
to reassess core assumptions about modern finance. Folks, BlackRock is the biggest asset manager in the world. When its CEO speaks of a fundamental reshaping of modern finance, shaking its core assumptions, that's serious stuff. In my letter, I cite other recent warnings of this systemic financial risk, all since I distributed the binder, many just this year. Here are a few instances. In December, the Bank of England proposed climate stress tests for corporations under its regulatory supervision. We started bank financial stress tests after the 2008 mortgage crisis. Central banks are starting to do the same for the climate crisis. In January, massive management consultant McKinsey, again, not a green group, but presumably a pretty smart group, warned that climate change could, and I'm quoting them here, make long-duration borrowing unavailable, impact insurance cost and availability, and reduce terminal values. Climate change could, the report continues, I'm quoting here, trigger capital reallocation and asset repricing, which is finance speak for fundamental upheaval of our economy. January, the World Economic Forum puts out its Global Risks Report, identifying the five most likely global risks facing the world over the next 10 years. The five most likely global risks facing the world over the next 10 years. Five for five, every single one of them was climate related. All five. And finally, from the Stanford Business School's Corporations and Society Initiative, a report warning that, and I quote, the financial risks from climate change are systemic. There's that word again, systemic. That these risks are, quote, singular in nature, like the green swan, black swan warning. And that, and I'm quoting here, global economic losses from climate change could reach $23 trillion, three or four times the scale of the 2008 financial crisis. Pause for a moment and recall the agony of the 2008 financial crisis. Losses in the stock market wiped out nearly $8 trillion. Housing values cratered, retirement savings vanished, and Americans lost jobs, lost homes, and lost nearly $10 trillion in wealth. Global economic growth went negative. We all went home to states where we witnessed extraordinary human suffering. Three or four times that? The Stanford report is telling us that we are courting financial peril, systemic risk, the likes of which we cannot imagine. Mr. President, climate change is a natural force. It has blown carbon dioxide levels way outside what humankind has ever experienced. It's depositing the equivalent of four Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs of excess heat per second into our oceans, per second. And it is an economic bomb positioned beneath our economy, its detonator ticking down steadily. We have a chance to defuse the bomb. With all these warnings that I described in this binder and that I described in my letter to the Banking Committee, with all these warnings comes a clear description of the solution. Government must act. Here are the solutions that I quote in my letter to the Banking Committee. 
Page 66 of Green Swan. End the procrastination that has been the dominant modus operandi of many governments for quite a while. By the way, here, it really hasn't been procrastination. It's been obstruction. It's been obstruction by the fossil fuel industry, its money, and its minions. But clearly, we haven't done anything serious about it. So that has to end. Page two of The Green Swan. The most obvious are the need for carbon pricing and for systematic disclosure of climate-related risks by the private sector. The most obvious are the need for carbon pricing. It is indeed obvious to people in the financial sector. It is only not obvious to us because fossil fuel money swirls all around this place trying to convince us that the obvious isn't true. But BlackRock CEO Fink's letter echoes that call for carbon pricing. He says, and I quote, carbon pricing is essential to combating climate change. So we have the warnings and we have the solutions. We have everything except the will to act. And the reason we don't have the will to act is because we have dark money political predators controlling our behavior in ways that are deeply, deeply inappropriate. When this blows, assume that these warnings are correct. When this blows, senators who didn't help us act will have to come up with a better excuse than, well, we weren't warned, because we were warned. We have been warned over and over and over again. We have been warned by experts. We have been warned by major financial institutions. We have been warned by the custodians of our economy, the central banks. Colleagues, you have the warnings in your inbox. When this blows up, when coastal property values crash, or when the carbon bubble bursts, or worse, when both happen, nothing says both can't happen, it is not going to look good to say, yeah, I was warned, but you see, my political party is funded by the fossil fuel industry, so naturally I did nothing. That's how you lose the privilege of representing people. It was a bit of a tempest in a teapot. It happened in Rhode Island 28 years ago. But I've lived through this. We had a financial crisis in Rhode Island in 1991. I was working for the governor who came in to have to clean up that horrible mess. And I was there for the following election, after the financial crisis hit. The legislators who slept through the warnings lost their jobs in a tidal wave of popular outrage. In the subsequent election, the 1992 election, more than a third of Rhode Island's General Assembly was either voted out or didn't even bother running again. There was a movie when I went to law school about the Harvard Law School. I think it was called 1L. And they brought in the freshman class, or the 1L class, and the crotchety old dean looked at them all and said, a third of you are going to be gone before you graduate, because this is so demanding. Look to your right. Look to your left. One of you will not be here at graduation. 
When this thing blows, that's going to be a look to your left, look to your right, one of you won't be here afterwards moment here in the United States Senate. You think people are mad now? Wait until this hits. Wait until these warnings come true and they know you were warned. Wait for that. It is time to wake up. I yield the floor.